So in verses 1 and 2, we just saw he rips their faces off for being babes. He tells them, I couldn't tell you anything. I, you know, I couldn't give you any wisdom. I couldn't impart unto you any mystery. Any uh, wisdom is what he calls it in chapter 2, verse 6. Verse 3, he says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So the mark of a carnal Christian, according to Paul, is you're divided one against another. There's envying. There's division. And I absolutely believe that there are saved Methodists. I believe that there are many of many people in the different denominations, like Presbyterians. Uh, there might be even be some Catholics. I think that the Methodists, I think that there are saved people in just about every church group, at least if they preach Jesus Christ and believing in him alone for salvation. Trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Those people are saved if they believe that. But why are there so many denominations in the church? Why are there a thousand different types of Baptists? It's a shame. It's a huge shame. And, you know, saints like to say, let's, let's get around. We're about to have, well, not we, but this county is about to have, what's it called? Is it Unity Fest? Unity Fest, where doesn't matter what denomination you are. doesn't matter what type of Christian you are. Let's get together and let's have Christian music and let's get together these Christian artists who the Christian artists, you know, they're just like what you probably think they are. They're just like Hollywood artists who couldn't make it in Hollywood, so they figured out they could use Jesus Christ's name to make a quick buck. That's how most of the Christ, famous Christian artists are. And this Unity Fest is a plan to get all these denominations together. The problem is... There should be no unity of saints who don't believe the same thing. He said in chapter 1 that there be no divisions among you. He said, speak this, mind the same thing, speak the same thing. We all ought to have the same doctrine, the same understanding, the same opinion. We shouldn't have a disagreement with the church down the street. Everybody in Christ's body should believe the same thing. Say, what should they believe? Exactly what Jesus Christ believes. His doctrine, his faith, the mind of Christ that he speaks about in chapter 2. That's what we should all believe. And the carnal Christians have envying, strife, and divisions. So, say, what's the reason for all the different denominations? The reason is that most Christians in the body of Christ are carnal. They got saved, and they never grew up. Now, be careful. I believe there are saved people in a lot of different denominations, but I do not believe that those people are all saved in those denominations. I believe that there's a whole lot of Baptists going to hell. I believe that there's a whole lot of Catholics going to hell. I believe there's a bunch of Methodists going to hell and Presbyterians, plenty of them going to hell. Being in the church doesn't make you saved. Trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ for your salvation makes you saved. Amen. Trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection is what gives you justification in the sight of God. And you've got to be careful of getting along with those carnal saints. He says in verse 4, For whilst one saith, I am of Paul, and another... I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed. If you go back to chapter 1, he said in verse 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I Cephas, and I have Christ. He says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Now, he's not telling you, Don't follow me, because in this same book, he's about to tell you, Be ye therefore followers of me, as I am of Christ. But he's letting them know, you shouldn't divide Paul from Apollos and Apollos from Christ. Verse 5, or 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Verse 8. Now, he that planteth, that's Paul, and he that watereth, that's Apollos, are one. Look, the ministers in your life are one. One plants, one waters, they did a different job. The guy who led you to the Lord and the guy who teaches you doctrine, they might not be the same person, but they're one in Christ. They are a minister by whom you believe, and no matter who led you to the Lord, it is God that gave the increase. It's God that gives you the increase in your own spiritual growth, too. And look at the second half of that verse. 
He says, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. He tells you right there that your works as a Christian, your labor matters. The work that you do as a Christian matters. Now, raise your hand if you got into Jesus Christ by labor. I got into Jesus Christ by faith, right? So did you. But he's letting you know the labor that you do, the whole body of work that you do as a saint is going to determine the reward that you receive. While we read the rest of this passage, you need to know that that phrase, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, that is the context for the rest of 1 Corinthians 3. That is how you understand the rest of the passage. Verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's... What's that word? I'm going to write that right here. God's building. What is God's building? According to what we just read. He said, ye are God's building, right? right? That's you. You are God's building. Verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Who laid the foundation of God's building? I have laid the foundation. And another buildeth thereon. So now you ought to be very interested. If I'm God's building and Paul laid the foundation, who is it that's building on top of that foundation? Look at verse 11. Oh, sorry. The end of verse 10. He says, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. You know what that tells me? He says, every man, that's you. That's me. Every man is responsible. You are responsible for the building that you build on top of the foundation of Jesus Christ. That building is you. It is your labor. It is your work. Verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation of Jesus Christ in your life was laid by the Apostle Paul, and then you build a building on top of that foundation. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And you, saint, or I'll use the word that Paul used. He said, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. You are a builder operating in the construction of God's building and habitation of God through the Spirit. It's very important that you understand this building. Verse 12, now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Who builds? This is every man's work. I don't believe that at the judgment seat you're going to be judged according to the works that you did. I don't think he's going to say, you did this then, and you did that then, and you did this then, and you did that then. I believe what abides the fire, what goes through fire, is the completed building that you are by the time you meet Jesus Christ. It is the labor that has been wrought inside of you. And you know from the rest of Paul's epistles that this labor had better not be carnal, it had better not be fleshly. What is built up inside of you had better be the Lord Jesus Christ. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't add carnal things to yourself. Add spiritual things. Don't seek the world. Seek Christ and let him be built up in you. Don't let the world be built up in you. He said, if any man build upon this foundation, what were the three things? Gold, silver, silver precious, stones. precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it, what's it? The work shall be, try, shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Say, what are the sorts? There's two sorts. 
There is a sort that abides the fire, and there is a sort that doesn't abide the fire. You want good? <laughs> you want the good stuff? Or you want the bad stuff? Good is gold, silver, precious stones. Bad, that doesn't abide the fire? Wood, hay, stubble. Say, Daniel, I'm not going to take your word for it. I want to see what the Bible says about those things, and I want to know that I'm building with gold, silver, and precious stones. He says, let every man take heed there how he buildeth thereupon, right? right? And that means somewhere in the Bible, he's going to tell you how you can know. He's not going to say, take heed to use gold, silver, and precious stones, and then just leave you in the dark as to what it means to build with gold, silver, and precious stones. So let's take a little bit of time here and see what is gold, silver, and precious stone, and how can we build with it? By the way, he said that God's building here I, I just said that I don't believe it's your works because in verse 13, it says every man's work, right? It doesn't say works. It says every man's work. That is the finished product. This is my work. This is the thing that I accomplished. And in verse 9, it says, who is God's husbandry? Who is God's building? Ye. The work is God's building. That is what's being tried by the fire. You are the work. That's why I say, I didn't clarify that, but when I say that I don't believe it's your works, it's what's built up in you, ye are the building. And the building is what's going through the fire. You are going through the fire at the judgment seat of Christ. That finished work, all, the accumulation of your Christian walk is going to go through the fire and you're going to find out if it's gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, stubble. And that scares me. <laughs> you should be terrified. You should be concerned that everything you're doing in this life is going to burn up and you're going to have no gold, silver, and precious stone. Now, we're going to answer a lot of questions tonight, like what is it? Why does it matter? Do I get to keep it or do I have to give it back to Jesus? The Bible has clear answers for these things. First, I want you to know that 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 40 and 41, it's telling you, about the body that you're going to receive, the resurrected body, the changed body. The Bible says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, right? He's talking about your body right there. Amen? Do we know that? You know that your physical body is going to be changed into an incorruptible body, right? Absolutely. In 1 Corinthians 15, 40 and 41, he's telling you about that change. And in verse 40, he says, there are also celestial bodies. He's saying the bodies up there, the celestial bodies, are not like the terrestrial, physical earthly bodies. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory, that word right there is very important. The glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Listen, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star different from another star in glory. Think about this for just a moment. Let's, uh, let's focus in on the gold, silver, and precious stones first. Can you see how gold, silver, and precious stones could line up with sun, moon, and stars? Does that make sense to you? What color is gold? Yellow. Yellow. The sun is yellow, gold, golden ray of sunshine. The moon is by the light of the silvery moon. <laughs> we all know that song. It's silver. The stars <laughs> twinkle and shine like precious stones. You ever seen a necklace made out of pearls? Shine a flashlight at it and it's going to look like stars in the night sky. Precious And it's obvious to you, it's obvious to me, which one of these three has the most glory? The sun's the brightest thing. It's the brightest thing in the sky. Gold is the most glorious of these three. The moon is the second best in the night sky. Silver is second to gold. And the stars twinkle, and as it is with precious stones, they differ in glory. Some stars are brighter than other stars. And I really believe, as we're going to see several scriptures about it, the reward that you receive 
is a body. And your body is going to be made up, I believe, of gold, silver, precious stones and shine like the sun, the moon, and the stars. Daniel, that's crazy. Well, amen. Turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 11. This is a passage that many saints have wondered about for a long time. And I don't claim to have the answers, but I claim to have at least a thought. Genesis 2, 11 and 12. It says, he's talking about the rivers in Eden that flow out of Eden. He says, the name of the first is Pison. That is a passage is like this. First Chronicles 29. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Solomon, or David is talking about a palace, a house that is to be built for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. And we just read this passage, but it says he prepared gold and silver and he included precious stones, right? He said, I prepared with all my might. And what's he going to build? The house of God, right? Well, he's not going to build it. Solomon's going to build it. And David prepared the gold, silver, and precious stones for it. Let me ask you. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's, ye are an habitation of God through the Spirit. What? Know ye not that your body is the, the temple that was built in the Old Testament is a picture of the true temple, which you are, and it was made of gold, silver, precious stones. And I believe that the bodies that we're going to get for all of eternity, which will become the perfect habitation of God, the sanctuary of God, his tabernacle, will be made of gold, silver, and precious stones according to the work of that we did in our lives. And the glory that you have in that temple is determined by the labor that you do in the word of God throughout your life. The amount that you let Christ be formed in you, the amount that Jesus Christ himself is in you is what will abide the fire. So your new body, I believe, will be made of that gold, silver, and precious stone. Just like Adam had it in the, in the dust, the dirt of that land. Look at Ezekiel 28, 13. Anybody guess who we're going to talk about in Ezekiel 28? Satan. Ezekiel 28, 13, talking about Lucifer, it says, By the way, thou hast been in, where? Ezekiel 28, 13, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. One more time, he's going to bring up Eden and connect it with gold, silver, precious stones. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Lucifer, before his fall, was in Eden, the garden of God, and his body included a covering that had gold and precious stones in his body just like those trumpets it says the tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created his body included these things and i believe the spiritual celestial body that we're going to get will be like adam's will be like satan's lucifer's before he was fallen not, not satan's now and one more example i'll give you it's in a couple passages. Daniel chapter 10. There's a man who shows up. We learn in Revelation that it's Jesus Christ. But in Daniel chapter 10, there's a description of Jesus Christ, and there's something very interesting about his body. Daniel 10, 5 and 6. I'm trying to show you some scripture about spiritual bodies and what your spiritual body is going to look like. Daniel 10, 5 and 6. It says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with fine what? Gold. His body also was like the barrel. You know that's a stone? Jesus Christ's body didn't look like flesh and blood. His spiritual body that Daniel saw, his spiritual body looked like a precious metal barrel. And his face is the appearance of lightning. And his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished what? Why is God describing Jesus Christ's spiritual body as a bunch of metals? 
and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Cross-reference that over to Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. Similar description of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1, 13 through 16. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto what? Why does God keep describing Jesus Christ's spiritual glorified body as being made up of metal, like gold, silver, and precious stones are metals? as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. <clears throat> very, very interesting. <clears throat> in 2 Chronicles, I'll read you this one. 2 Chronicles 32, 26, and 27, it describes Hezekiah, and he humbled himself <clears throat> in 2 Chronicles 32, 26, and 27. Say, Daniel, I see what you're saying. <laughs> Obviously, this gold, silver, and precious stone has to do with the body that I'm going to receive. My body, flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So what is our body going to look like if it's not going to be flesh and blood? Well, I believe you're either going to be naked and ashamed, or you're going to have gold, silver, and precious stones. And everybody's body is going to have a different glory depending on what abided the fire. That determined, that's determined by your labor in this life. 2 Corinthians 32 and verse 26 and 27, it says, Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. He's letting you know Hezekiah humbled himself. And what was the result of his humbling himself? And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor, and he made himself treasures for silver and for gold and for precious stones. Did you say Second Chronicles or Second Chronicles? Chronicles. Okay. Second Chronicles. 32, and 27. So Hezekiah humbles himself and immediately God points out he was exceeding rich in gold, silver, and precious stones. Can you think of somebody else who humbled himself in your Bible? Became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? Christ. Jesus Christ humbled himself. And I believe in the Old Testament, he's given you a picture there. Somebody humbles himself. God's going to reward him with gold, silver, and precious stones. Jesus Christ humbled himself more than any other man ever could. And he gets the most glorious and beautiful body anybody could ever have. And I believe as a Christian, the amount that you humble yourself and you allow yourself to be conformed to the image of Christ is the gold, silver, and precious stone. It's your labor. It's your work. And in context... Of what we've just studied, it is how much you grew up from being a babe into becoming a man. And in Ephesians 4, that perfect man that he's talking about is not you in your flesh. It is Jesus Christ that you are being grown into. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So real simple, the more you allow yourself to be conformed into Christ's image before you meet the Lord, determines how much of a glorified body you're going to get. I believe it. Yes, sir. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, you can turn back to 1 Corinthians 3. I'm going to read you one more verse while you do it. Daniel 12, 3. He says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. The sun, moon, and the stars are in the firmament. Gold, silver, and precious stone will make you shine with brightness for all of eternity. That's the good side. That's what abides the fire. Here's what should terrify you. You can also, instead of laying up gold, silver, and precious stones, instead of building those things up in yourself, you can build yourself up with wood, hay, and stubble. That was the good. Here's the bad. Wood, hay, and stubble. We're going to see some scripture to help us understand what that is. Jeremiah 23, 28. Now, we've got a bunch of verses here, and I'll you can write them down. I'll read them to you. I've got them 
actually written out here. Jeremiah 23, 28. He says, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? In that same passage, he says, Is not my word like as a fire, like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? And Jeremiah, he's letting the false prophets know, you can make up your own words all you want. It's not going to compare to my word. What is the chaff to the wheat? You know what chaff is? When somebody gathers wheat into the garner and they thresh the wheat, you get the good grain, right? The wheat and the chaff is the fluff that you could basically just, you know, clap it in your hands and it turns into powder. That's the stuff that blows away. That's the stuff that gets burned up. that has no use. God is saying the chaff is your fake words, false prophets, and the good words, my words, are the wheat. And he's talking about fire in that context, that the wheat will abide the fire, the chaff will get burned up. That's what he says in Matthew. He will gather his wheat into the garner, but the chaff will he burn with unquenchable fire. And I believe at the judgment seat of Christ, what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 3, with a lot of these cross-references, you say, what is wood, hay, and stubble? Well, according to that verse and several others that we're going to look at, Let me ask you this. If Jesus Christ being formed in you is what turns into gold, silver, and precious stones, who is Jesus Christ? What's his title in John 1.1? 1, 1? He's the Word. Jesus Christ is the Word. You can't separate these words from Jesus Christ. While you're having Christ formed in you, the Bible clearly says he is writing on your heart, fleshy tables of your heart in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Christ being formed in you is literally Jesus Christ being written, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God on fleshy tables of the heart. But you can choose to reject Jesus Christ in his words, and you can have the wisdom of this world, 1 Corinthians 2. You can have carnal things, 1 Corinthians 3. You can stay a babe and not have his words written in your heart, and you can have other words written in your heart. You can fill your life with television instead of the word of God. And you say, Daniel... What's the difference? The difference is, if, that tele if you can sit here and tell me more about your favorite TV show than about the book of Zechariah, then that TV show is going to burn up at this judgment seat because that's what's written on your heart. That's the chaff. What I want is wheat. I want the word of God, Jesus Christ, that's going to abide. Not the junk of this world that's going to burn up. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. I believe that absolutely has application to the judgment, that God is going to reprove those who added to his words, and you're found a liar. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. He says, Matthew 15, 8 and 9. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That is the wisdom of men being put in their hearts instead of the truth of God's word. And if you allow the wisdom of men to be built up in your heart instead of the truth of God's word, that's going to be wood, hay, stubble instead of gold, silver, precious stones. Colossians 2 has a really interesting progression with this, this idea. In verse 4, 8, and 18, it mentions this three times. Colossians 2, 4, it says, Let no man beguile you with enticing words. That's Colossians 2, 4. In Colossians 2, 8, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. In Colossians 2, 18 and 19, he combines that spoiling and that beguiling with enticing words. And he says, let no man beguile you of your reward. In Colossians 2, he warns you three times, there are going to be men in your life who try to give you enticing words they're going to be philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men, instead of God's words. Don't let those men beguile you out of your reward. And remember, the context of this is uh, every man will be given a reward according to his labor. There are men, false teachers, who can come into your life and take your reward away from you, beguile you of that reward by putting philosophy and the wisdom of man's words into your heart instead of God's wisdom and the words of God. 
and they beguile you and take away the reward that you could have. Colossians 2.19 is when he says, And not holding the head, from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Turn over to 2 Timothy 2.19 and 21. 2 Timothy 2.19. <laughs> Stick with me here. We're almost finished. Getting towards the end. 2 Timothy 2.19-21. These things, I wish, I wish 10 years ago somebody would have sat down with a Bible and showed me what the gold, silver, precious stones and wood, hay, stubble were, but nobody apparently knew. So, uh, that, I mean, this is, this is stuff that will affect you for all of eternity. He says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows that you are his, and because he knows you are his, you're going to stand at the judgment seat as a child of God. The question is, are you going to depart from iniquity? Verse 20, but in a great house, that's God's house, the church, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. And some to honor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. There is a good work that God wants to prepare you for. And in this life, the labor that God wants to do in you determines whether you're going to be an honorable vessel or a dishonorable vessel for all of eternity. That's a scary thing. That should terrify you and make you want to purge yourself from dead works. To make yourself a sanctified vessel that's meet for the master's use. To submit to the Holy Spirit of God and let him be your source of life and not your flesh. All right, back to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse uh, 12, we just saw the gold, silver, precious stones, the wood, hay, stubble. What's the wood, hay, stubble? It is... The words of man's wisdom being built up inside you instead of God. Verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Really easy question for you. What do you think is going to abide? Gold, silver, precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble? Wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up. Absolutely. It says, if any man's work abide, that's the gold, silver, precious stones, he shall receive a reward. And I believe that reward is a body determined by what abides the fire. In Colossians 3.24, he talks about the reward of the inheritance. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, this is important here, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul, what are you talking about? I'm saying I just described to you in 1 Corinthians 15, the different glories of bodies that saints will get. And I'm telling you, your work is not in vain. Be steadfast, unmovable. Why? Because the labor you're doing now determines how much glory you're going to have. Determines the type of service you're going to have to God for all of eternity. These things, by the way, pertain to Melchizedek. They pertain to his priesthood in the heavens. We'll talk about that uh, later on as we get into Hebrews. But it's very important you understand that Heaven is not standing around the throne and praising God forever. There is a work that God has purposed for Christ's body, and it has to do with reconciling the heavens and the earth to himself. And in that building, the house of God, I want to be a vessel unto honor, not a vessel of dishonor. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14, it says that the inheritance has to do with the redemption of the purchased possession. I'm trying to let you know, you can go and study those on your own. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14 trying to let you know that this inheritance that he's talking about, the reward 
has to do with your body, the redemption of the purchased possession. And in Ephesians 1.18, I'll quote the part of this for you. It says, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Did you catch that word? The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That gold, silver, and precious stones is in your body. Your inheritance is in you for eternity. And just like Jesus Christ has a beautiful, shining metal body, I believe that saints who are conformed to Christ's image will get bodies according to how much they allowed, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. <clears throat> Verse 15, 1 Corinthians 3, 15. He says, if any man's work shall be burned, what if I have wood, hay, stubble, Daniel? If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. You say loss of what? Not salvation. He shall suffer loss of reward. You're going to lose the reward. You're going to lose the glory that Jesus Christ wants you to have. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. When you get to the judgment seat of Christ, and if all you have written inside you, if all you have in your heart is man's wisdom, and you neglected the book that God gave you, which is able to give you an inheritance, and able to make you wise unto salvation... If you neglected this book and only have man's wisdom, do you think God wants a person who's just full of man's wisdom in his kingdom? So what's he going to do? How's he going to get rid of that wisdom that's written in you? He's going to burn it up. That means who you are by the time you meet Jesus Christ. If you're wood, hay, and stubble, your whole identity, the things that you have, the labor that you have done, the, the heart that you have will be burned up not you, you won't cease to exist, but you'll be naked. No glory, no gold, no silver, no precious stones. I don't even know if you're going to shine. You're going to be a vessel of dishonor. You say, for all of eternity, I thought I was going to be just like Jesus Christ. Yeah, I used to think that too. Then the Bible corrected me. This is clear. He shall suffer loss. You're going to lose out on the inheritance. He just said in Colossians, let no man beguile you of your reward. You can have that reward taken away. It's not guaranteed to you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, that was 14. Uh, that, sorry, that was 15. <clears throat> Ephesians 5.5, 5, talking about suffering loss. Ephesians 5.5 5 says, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance. No inheritance for fornicators, covetous, idolaters. That's saints who spend their lives and build up fornication, covetousness, and idolatry. Those people have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's a scary thing. I'm going to read you a couple verses throughout the rest of 1 Corinthians here. He says in 1 Corinthians 5, 5. These all go together, by the way. In Corinthians, he's building doctrine. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. He's talking about the guy who's fornicating with his father's wife. And it says, to deliver such an one unto Satan. Why? Kick him out of the church. Why? For the destruction of the flesh. Well, why would you do that? That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. A man who commits fornication is destroying any chance he has at getting a reward. Destroying it. That's 1 Corinthians 5 5. Look, or you can turn there if you want. 1 Corinthians 6 18. Along the same line, now each chapter is not some whole new idea he's building here. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. Why? Every sin that a man doeth without the body, uh, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Say, so he sinneth against his own body. How's that? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You say, why does he care about fornication so much in 1 Corinthians? Because he's trying to let you know, if you fornicate with your body, you are sinning against your own body, and you will be destroyed at the judgment seat. 1 Corinthians 7. This very interesting verse right here. You know the purpose of marriage in 1 Corinthians 7? Three simple words in 1 Corinthians 7 too. The reason he tells the Corinthians to get married is... Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. In 1 Corinthians, he is giving them strong warning about fornication. 
you'll destroy your own body, Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians 7, he gives them rules about marriage to avoid fornication. And then in verse uh, 9, he says this, But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. I have always read that verse like this. It's better to marry than to burn in lust in your heart. You know that proverb, can a man take fire in his bosom and not be burned? You've heard that, right? In Romans 1, it says that the Sodomites burned in their lust one toward another. I've always read that verse like that. But if you pay attention to the context of 1 Corinthians, there is a burning that happens to the body. In chapter 5, he talks about a fornicator having his flesh destroyed. In chapter 7, he says to avoid fornication. In chapter uh, 6, he said, he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Chapter 7, it is better to marry. Why do you marry? To avoid fornication. It's better to marry than to burn. What's he saying? If you fornicate as a Christian, you're going to burn. You say in hell? No, at the judgment seat. For your fornication. What you built up in your body was fornication instead of Jesus Christ, and it'll burn up. And I can tell you something, that verse means a whole lot more to me now. The threat of, you'll just lust for the rest of your life if you don't marry. You'll burn in lust. That's, you know, that's bad, but that doesn't terrify me. What terrifies me is, if I commit fornication, the whole labor that I'm trying to do for the Lord and the seeking God that I'm trying to do will burn up like chaff at the judgment seat. That's a scary thing. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God, what? Well, there's a destruction of a saint. At the judgment seat of Christ, a saint will be destroyed if in his life he defiled the temple of God through fornication. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. I'm going to read you two quick verses. 2 Corinthians 11, 15. He's talking about the apostles of Satan. In 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen. 15, he says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You see that? The apostles of Satan, the ministers of Satan, their end is is going to be according to their works. Do you think that's going to be a good end? No, their works are bad. They're going to have a bad end. And in Philippians 3.18, he says something very similar. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. Paul is talking about people who once preached the faith. I believe they're saved. And he says, now they're the enemies of the cross of Christ, and what's their end? Destruction. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. There is a destruction coming to some saints at the judgment seat of Christ. He shall suffer loss. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, you'll receive the things done in his body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. You'll receive for the bad. It's a terrifying thing. You don't want to be caught up in that. <clears throat> Lastly there in 1 Corinthians 3, 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Why? That he may be wise. Hey, listen, babes. If you're wise in this world... If anybody in your church thinks he's wise, I'm telling you, he's wise in the wisdom of this world, and he better go back to ground zero. He better go back to being a fool. Forget everything he thinks he knows and start to learn Christ, that he may be wise. Because if he stays wise according to the world, he's going to burn. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore... Let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether, they, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death, the things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's, and Christ 
is God's. 1 Corinthians 3 is a heavy-hitting chapter. You're babes, and I'm telling you, the consequence of you staying a babe is that you're going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. Do not remain a babe. Get in the Word of God. Get addicted to it. Dedicate your life to the study and reading of the King James Bible. Memorize it. Ask questions about it. Talk to saints about it. Make it your life. Does anybody have any questions about that? I hope the judgment seat of Christ is a little clearer to you now. I hope you understand what it's about a little better. And I hope that pushes you to labor for those gold, silver, and precious stones instead of wood, hay, and stubble. It's a terrifying thing. It's a, what does he say? Awful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It is a... I forgot what it is. It's in Hebrews somewhere. Fearful. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And you ought to be afraid.